Uh, today's speaker is uh, Gordon Stacey from uh, Cornell University. Uh, uh, Gordon did his uh, undergraduate degree in physics at uh, Grinnell uh, College, yeah. and then moved to uh, Cornell, did a PhD, uh, finished in 85, moved out to the West Coast, uh, worked with uh, Charlie Towns, uh, built instrumentation in the far infrared, flew it on the Kuiper Observatory, and then moved back to Ithaca, became a professor at Cornell, has been developing instrumentation in the, from the infrared to the sub-millimeter uh, since. And today he's going to tell us about the work he's doing at the moment. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Zoran. You can hear me, right? Wow, what an excellent system. I don't hear anything funny. Uh, and uh, it's really nice to be here. It's a fantastic place. Uh, there's a lot of good great stuff going on. Fun to talk to people. Um, so I thought I'd, because uh, it's kind of a diverse audience, uh, focus a little bit, and I know there's a lot of people that are into technology. Uh, it's, in, it's in the name of the school. Uh, and so I'm, I'm focusing uh, on our instrumentation efforts, and I'm going to throw in splashes of science from time to time, which are more or less just highlights of uh, what we've done with various instruments. So we built state-of-the-art instruments for the sub-millimeter bands. Uh, direct detection is what we uh, do, which means we uh, use uh, uh, the, uh, the photon energy, not the wave nature. And uh, we study star and galaxy formation over cosmic time. It's not you, it's in Spain. And students, of course, do most of the heavy lifting. They do most of the instrumentation building. And they have the lion's share of a lot of the stuff. And we get to go to interesting places. So the submillimeter band is a, a short words of a millimeter, long words of 200 microns, dependent, uh, defined more or less by the technology. Uh, at, uh, when I started my career, uh, stuff long word of 200 micron spectroscopy was done uh, by 109 receivers, which detect the wave nature of light. And, uh, and stuff short word of 200 micron was done almost exclusively uh, by uh, photoconductors and, uh, and direct detection receivers which uh, detect the particle nature of light. Um, so what's it good for? Why do we bother with submillimeter astronomy? Uh, big reasons are uh, uh, extinction and energetics. Uh, the energy of uh, most of the radiant light of the galaxy and of the universe comes from uh, photospheres of stars. And it comes out visible. And stars are formed in molecular clouds. Molecular clouds are dusty. Uh, the size of the appears just characteristic size of a uh, dust particle is 0.1 microns, which is a uh, characteristic wavelength of visible light. So the uh, dust interacts very strongly with the light and uh, scatters the light and absorbs the light. And we call, refer to this as extinction. <laughs> I feel like I'm having a little problem. <laughs> so because of this extinction, you can't see star formation regions uh, in the uh, uh, invisible, we can't see them where, where stars actually forming in the visible. And you have to go to longer wavelengths. The effect is huge. It's such that one visible photon in 10 billion from the galactic center actually reaches us, uh, our telescopes. But if you go to wavelengths as short as long as 40 microns, 90% uh, of the photons will reach us. So here's the illustration of that. The galactic plane is marked here. The galactic center is at the end of the teapot spout, as we all know and uh, heavily obscured by nearby uh, um, electric clouds. And there's the same view of the uh, 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 two-mass survey working at two microns. You can start to see the stellar cluster popping out, and the foreground clouds are starting to vanish. And if you go into the uh, far infrared bands, this is the IRS uh, view of the uh, Milky Way. And there's the galactic center, and there's the very pancake-like structure of the Milky Way showing through. The aspect ratio of the Milky Way is 1% to one hundred, one percent, right? It's very thin, more like a crepe than a pancake. And uh, we also trace energetics. Here's a view in the visible of the whole Hopula region of the Milky Way galaxy. And plopped down on top of that is a beautiful image of uh, the same region in the uh, submillimeter bands taken by the Herschel satellite. 
and you can see the uh, filamentary structure of the interstellar medium. You can see cores of stars where they're forming, and it's a quite a different view. Um, and the view is of star formation. So stellar nurseries glow in subliminal light. And the final example in that regards is the uh, nearby uh, uh, galaxy of uh, Andromeda in the visible, Andromeda in the infrared. Put them on top of each other, you see the infrared pops right down on top of the dust lanes. And so those are basically the regions where the stars are being formed. So that's the continuum. In uh, the lines, of course, the lines don't are not affected by extinction either, but the lines are very important for uh, cooling the gas. So there's a bunch of fine structured lines, six of them that we uh, observe very routinely. They're very strong in these star-forming galaxies. M82 is the one that people are probably most familiar with. And uh, stars form in gas clouds. The gas cloud would collapse. Potential energy goes in. Kinetic energy heats the gas. And when the gas gets heated, the thermal pressure goes up. Collapse can pause. So you need to cool the cloud to enable the collapse to continue. And what does that is spectral lines. And the far infrared submillimeter bands are uh, contain many lines that are important <coughs> coolants of uh, both uh, ionized and uh, uh, neutral gas. So here's a very famous artist made this nice uh, drawing of a molecular cloud, and it's very detailed. So the green is the molecular cloud, the uh, yellowish is the H2 regions, the ionized hydrogen regions, which form around uh, Earth, uh, young stars as they're formed, hot stars. And this uh, polka dotted region is the interface between the uh, UV and the uh, shielded by dust regions of the molecular cloud, uh, which are dark. And what we see is uh, low and mid JCO lines and water uh, lines coming from the molecular cloud. They cool the cloud in face of physical conditions. Uh, the ionized gas regions will have uh, fine structure lines, far infrared fine structure lines, nitrogen 2 and oxygen 3. And these so called photo dissociation regions, where the molecules are photo dissociated into atoms, uh, uh, will have uh, important tracers of ionized carbon, neutral oxygen in the mid-JCO lines. These are the regions, when the energy is bigger than 13.6, the energy of the photon is from the star is totally gobbled by the H2 region. When the energy is less than 13.6, the ionization edge of hydrogen, it escapes the H2 region and heats this uh, surface, this photo-associated surface. So I've been talking about uh, heating and cooling, and so uh, the same famous artist went through some uh, really great graphics that well, you guys here might appreciate this because because I'm you know I'm trying to be a really graph good graphicist. <laughs> this is the uh, the fine structure levels of uh, doubly ionized oxygen. Uh, things differing in the uh, the uh, uh, angular momentum uh, states of the electrons, and this is energy above ground in kelvins. And um, I'm going to look at a photon. Uh, sorry, oops, I did it wrong. Start, go back. Okay. So uh, an electron comes in. The electron has kinetic energy. It boosts the uh, uh, the configuration from this level to that level, which is from the ground to the excited level. And then in a, uh, a short period of time, a month or so, the uh, guy decays and gives off a photon. And that photon takes, isn't that brilliant? That photon <laughs> takes the, uh, the what was kinetic energy out of the cloud delivered and delivers it outside the cloud. And it's important that that photon does, isn't bothered by dust either. It has to escape. So these are important cooling lines. And because they're important cooling lines, um, they're also, uh, they enable the cloud to collapse. And they also trace the physical conditions of the gas because different lines have different density to, uh, depend dependencies. Um, if you think about it, it's a collisional process. The electron collides with the uh, atom or ion, and the collisional rate is proportional to number density of electrons, number density of atoms or ions, and they, the cross section for the collision, how big the target is, and the velocity. So you get temperature and you get density out of these things. And uh, gives you also the abundance of the ions, which comes out of that term, and therefore you get physical conditions of gas. Of course, that is the heating, uh, the cooling of the gas. This is the heating of the gas. So you also get the parameters of the stars. And things that are uh, most interesting are the surface temperature of the stars, the effective photospheric temperature, because that is traced by the ionization state. And that the, uh, the, uh, gives you the most massive star on the main sequence. 
Um, and that's because the most massive stars typically generate the radiate, dominate the radiation field in a stellar cluster or even in a galaxy. And so if it's a very hot star, you'll have higher ionization states of atoms rather than a, a, a rather relatively cool star, you'll have lower ionization states. So I measure the ionization state of the ionized gas, and I get the most massive star on the, H on the main sequence, which means the youngest star on the main sequence. Massive stars go through their fuel much more quickly. And so I, get, I age the uh, stellar uh, uh, population. <coughs> So, you guys are all disciples of sub astronomy by now, I'm sure, <laughs> especially after my brilliant illustrations. And uh, why isn't everybody doing it? And uh, it's, it's challenging. The water vapor of the atmosphere uh, blanks off most of the uh, sub bands, effectively all of them. So, you need to get high and dry. Uh, the instrumentation is uh, difficult because there's no real push for, from industry. Uh, the money for detector development is coming from federal agencies, and so that's how we get our stuff going. Uh, and uh, we need to be photon background limited at very low photon uh, flux rates. And so that pushes the, detect the technology of direct detection, and the frequencies are high, which pushes the technology of uh, coherent detectors. So these are the detectors that uh, we've been using for the, the past uh, 20 years now, I guess. Um, and they're bolometers. And so here's the simple bolometer. You basically have a heat sink, which is something that's very cold. The temperatures are uh, 0.3 to 0.1 kelvins. And you uh, have a very thin, a very uh, low uh, uh, volume uh, of bolometer on which is an absorber. And uh, the bolometer also has the thermometer on it. And there, there's weak electrical and thermal links between the bolometer and the heat sink. So the photon comes in, it heats up the bolometer through the, it pitch absorb, heats up the bolometer. Uh, when the bolometer uh, heats up, it changes the, uh, the impedance of the thermometer. And we measure the change in the impedance of the thermometer uh, through the electrical links. And so it's important to get very cold uh, because the specific heat is proportional to T cubed at these temperatures. And you want a very small mass. And that makes, therefore, a big delta T for the uh, small number of delta photons. And uh, the thermometer is basically a heavily doped region in a simple model, a model of, uh, of the silicon uh, substrate, which uh, has a tight, high temperature coefficient of, uh, of resistance. So the devices, are, as I said, are held at low uh, temperature by either helium-3 refrigerators, which gives you numbers like that, or adiabatic demagnetization refrigerators, which could be numbers like 70 millikelvin or so. Um, so uh, how do we do it? And so the way most of the work um, that I've been doing, that my group has been doing, is uh, spectroscopy. And uh, so we have some very handsome people uh, for a representation of our group in here uh, in front of two of our spectrometers. This is Zeus 1. It's an imaging, uh, sorry, it's a long slit grading spectrometer. And this is Zeus 2. It's a, uh, uh, a long slit, sorry, this is a single pixel grading spectrometer, a long spectrum. This is a long slit grading spectrometer. Uh, this one is operating on the Apex telescope in Chile. This one used to operate on the CSO telescope in uh, Mauna Kea. And before that, we had an imaging fabric probe called SPITI, South Pole Imaging Fabric Probe Interferometer. And that was on the uh, 15 meter JCMT in Mauna Kea. And then it, uh, its last uh, uh, incarnation was at the Astro Telescope at South Pole. And we're also uh, we're leading the design study uh, for a uh, camera for um, the CCAT telescope, which I'll talk about at the end. And uh, that was uh, designed to go at the summit of Sierra Chatnator in Chile. And that was using others as well. So uh, close up of the bolometer array from uh, Zeus 1. Uh, this is a 1 by 32 pixel from a Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, the pixels are 1 by 1 millimeters. They're one micron thick silicon membrane, so it's very thin, wafer thin, as I say. And they're supported on wafer thin legs that are 10 microns uh, wide. And the back face of these guys is metalized with a chromium uh, gold film. And that gives the magic impedance of 175 uh, ohms per square, which uh, gives you, combined with a back short, this is a quarter wavelength back short. So you have 
the detector here, and it's a quarter wave like between the detector and a piece of metal. And so you have a resonant cavity back there. So the photon bounces a bunch of times if it doesn't get absorbed. And so the absorbance efficiency goes way up. And so it can be as high as 100%. We get numbers of about 80% typically. Um, the thyristors are created by ion implanting uh, the front face with um, the phosphorus-boron ions. And uh, the pixels themselves are attached, as I said, to by thin legs, one micron thin, 10 micron wide legs that pull in opposite directions. And legs are, of course, uh, heavily doped to make uh, good conduction pathways uh, for signals so that we can measure them. So the readout of these type of detectors is, uh, is essentially trivial uh, uh, to understand. It's, uh, it's, of course, challenging to get the low noise that we require. But uh, it's basically a voltage divider. So you put a load resistor um, in a series with a volometer. The volometer is a variable resistor. Our volometers were like between one and five mega ohms, and the loads were about uh, 20 mega ohms or something like that. And we put a, a small bias, a few millivolts across that. So there's a constant current going through this thing determined by the load because it's the dominant guy. And then I just measure the output uh, uh, the, the, at this point compared to ground, and that gives me the uh, impedance of the detector, which is variable because the photon flux uh, as the flux goes up, the impedance goes down. So the important characteristics are, oh, the output is, of course, buffered by JFS, and that's the actual physical signal that you go to your computer and all that kind of stuff. So the important thing is it's uh, small thermal mass and uh, small but uh, tuned thermal conductance for legs. You have to have the right number because you want large response. You don't want to be too tightly thermally conducted because then it's not going to go up in temperature at all, right? Uh, but I, if I make it too loose in thermal uh, uh, conduct, uh, connection, it'll go way up in temperature, then I have a long time constant before the energy gets out and gets sucked out. So you have to tune that. So you want, it's a balance between uh, large response and quick, uh, uh, and uh, delta T for photon power and quick response. And the low T wins in all regards. So the new instrument, Zeus II, has a much uh, a more sophisticated detector in it. Um, it's based on transition edge uh, sensed uh, 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 volometers. And so, what's that all about? So, we have a superconductor right there. That's the transition edge sensor. In the middle of uh, uh, this uh, a screen, which is the absorber. So, it's a screen to make the thermal mass small. And the photon, uh, this is typically uh, uh, three wavelengths across there, so that screen mesh it doesn't see. It's, it's all a, a uniform surface to it. And so um, we get the below thermal mass, which is nice. This, this uh, TES, transition edge sensor, is basically just a uh, superconductor. And we bias a superconductor such that it's balanced between uh, being a superconductor and being normal. So we bias it right there. And when the photons come in, of course, it heats up the volometer, so it drives it towards normal. And so we have a feedback loop that drives us back towards superconductor. So we're on the hairy edge all the time at the transition edge. So as you might imagine, it's very sensitive to small changes in temperature. It goes bang, bang, bang to the rail all the time. So you have to have a nice tight feedback loop, so that's the complication of these things. But the fact that it has a very high temperature coefficient of resistance means that it's got a very big signal. And so once you get the signal out, it's uh, a much easier thing to, to work. And it's also less, uh, uh, much, much less susceptible to uh, microphonics because the impedance of these things are essentially zero. Um, so there's a picture of the array in Zeus II as it was uh, uh, a year ago. <coughs> Um, it's a, here's the array itself. This is a array of uh, nine by 40 pixels, basically. We're looking at the back side of the detector. And um, that thing has a back short tuned to 400 microns, so it works both at 350 and 450 microns. And there's a fancy silicon interconnect board with superconducting traces, because everything's superconducting. It's read out by squids and all these uh, fancy things like that, so it has to be kept cold and superconducting. And it, when uh, we're totally done, which is within a month now, we will have put our other array in there. And so this is a 350, 450, and this is a 200 micron array and a 650 micron array. 
So at the apex site, the transmission uh, on a good night is about, oh gosh, it can be 50% here, which for a sub-millimeter observer is fantastic. So that was too easy, so we wanted to put the 200 micron array in there where the transmission's only 10% on the best nights. Because punishment is good for the soul. <laughs> so uh, a, bit, a, a few more words about the sites. Um, you need a high and dry. Aircraft are fantastic, but you can't put a very big telescope on an aircraft. Uh, Mauna Kea is pretty good. Uh, the best 20% has one millimeter of precipitable water. You take all the water in the atmosphere, and it down to one millimeter thick lake. Uh, the South Pole has the smallest numbers, uh, 0.2 millimeters precipitable water for the best 20%. The Atacama, where the Alma array is at 5,000 meters, uh, has about uh, 0.3 millimeters of water. So water vapor kills transmission. So let's look at the Mauna Kea case, one millimeters, 370 microns, and Zenith looking to up and looking 30 degrees over. Well, when I look uh, 30, uh, 60 degrees over, elevation of 30 degrees, when I look at elevation, I'm effectively looking at two air masses if I'm in a planar uh, atmosphere rather than one air mass looking straight up twice as much. So it goes as the square, right? And so it was 25% uh, the Zenith at 30 degrees is just 6%, 25% squared. So the transmissions are ridiculous now. Um, if I go to 0.3 millimeters, the numbers don't change nearly as much. 0.2 meters don't change as nearly as much. So you win much faster than you even think, right? Because you have to observe at the zenith when it's a crappy atmosphere. So those are the telescopes we've used on Mauna Kea. The <coughs> is uh, James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, also known as Maxwell House because it looks like a Maxwell House coffee can. And uh, it's got a 15-meter telescope in it. And there's the uh, CSO, which has a 10.4-meter telescope in it. Looks like a full software. So uh, there's the JCMT, and there's a very handsome crew. Many years ago on the JCMT, about 15 years ago or so, uh, when we first were installing uh, that instrument there. And basically, the Imaging Fabric Pro, SPIFI, uh, one, probably the most significant, we mapped the Galactic Center, did some nice work there. But I think the most significant thing we did there was looking at uh, nearby Starburst galaxies. And we looked at the mid JCO lines. And we found that uh, to get the excitation of mid-JCO lines, we needed micro-turbulence. We needed the clouds to be really stirred up. And then when you run that thought process a little bit further, if you stir up a molecular cloud that's supposedly forming a star, it's going to have a hard time forming the next generation of stars. So the first generation of stars is killing the star uh, burst activity. Um, so this is a little bit of the, of the technology uh, in regards of spectrometers. This is one of our uh, Fabric Pros. This is the biggest one that we made for uh, Spiffy. So it was one of the later generation ones as well. So we use freestanding metal meshes to make our mirrors. And uh, so let me, for, uh, for those that don't know, describe what a Fabric Pro is. So if, you, if I take my hands and make them 99% uh, reflect them and get them really parallel. And then I shoot light in from this direction. The light with a half integer multiple of wavelengths fits nicely in there, makes a standing wave, it becomes a resonant cavity, that light goes right through. Light that isn't that wavelength gets reflected back because it's 99% reflective. And so I tune my cavity by just doing this, right? Shorter wavelength, longer, longer wavelength. So that's how I get my resolving power and how I change the wavelength. So we have these uh, things set up, that's about 10, uh, 12 centimeters. With freestanding metal mesh, it looks like microscopic window screen. And uh, we have PZTs that tilt those uh, etalons to make them perfectly parallel when it's cryogenic. This thing ran at, uh, this one ran at 70 Kelvin. We had a lot of them that run at 4 Kelvin. And then we translate on a, uh, on a uh, deformable powder hologram, which is a little hard to see. <coughs> but this is a, a very thin piece of metal. This is a very thin piece of metal. It's basically a, a thin piece here. And now you can see that it's tilted, right? and it's being tilted by a screw that's being uh, driven by a separate <coughs> motor pushing that forward. So one of the mirrors is moving nicely parallel to the other guy because it's hanging off this tilted parallelogram. So that works very well, and almost all, all, all of our are based on that principle. Ah, so there's the, the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, what time is it? So, uh, the best South Pole, the best Chile. Uh, so this is the best Chile and South Pole transmissions at uh, 
at the, at the 450 and 350 microns. Here's the terahertz bands, 200 microns. You see you have to have the absolute best nights uh, at uh, the terahertz to get any transmission at all. But in principle, if you get down to 0.2 millimeters, you can get as high as 40% uh, 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 at those wavelengths. And so we took uh, Spiffy to the South Pole. So this is uh, just a kind of a fun little segue, segue uh, to, uh, to the South Pole. Um, so Spiffy had been running on JCMT, and we live in Ithaca, and uh, we went to the South Pole of the uh, Christ Church. And then you first go to McBurdo, uh, College Airplane on the right, and uh, they drop you out there. There's Scott's hut, so it's really cool historical stuff there. And there's penguins there. And then you fly <laughs> to the South Pole itself, and you get to go across the Trans Antarctic Mountains, and you get to see the what's it called the uh, the, the barrier, which is the between the Ross Ice Shelf and the end of the uh, Beardmore Glacier, the giant glacier. So it's really cool. We land at the South Pole. And we took Spiffy from the world's, what was the world's largest submillimeter telescope, and put it on the world's smallest telescope, submillimeter telescope, the 1.67 meter astro <laughs> telescope. Because it's a thing to do. No, we wanted to do the nitrogen 2 light at 200 microns. So there's that little telescope. It's an off axis parabola light. And when you see Spiffy mounted, you realize it's about the same size as the telescope. So Spiffy, not, this, this is, so my uh, post, uh, post my research associate, Thomas Nicola, uh, work with him forever. Uh, he, he describes it as, as the, this Spiffy pleasure dome uh, because it was just where all the punishment happens down there. Right? <laughs> where you do all the real work where you put the thing together and make it work. So that was the Quonset hut, uh, about 100 yards or something from the actual telescope. And they took the world's biggest crane and took it from that hut and moved it over there. You really needed something that big. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you do your sky drop. And, uh, so it's pretty funny. And boy, there's the uh, there's the telescope. There's the instrument. So it's pretty funny. And here's the the poor uh, engineer uh, Steve, who we right before we left him behind to do the winter of. <laughs> so uh, we uh, and you have hero shots, right? Very important. <laughs> I stole the South Pole. So what we did um, there is we we made nice uh, images of uh, nitrogen too. So nitrogen 2 is another one of these fine structural lines, and it's the one that traces the number of ionizing photons pretty well. So it's uh, extension free and all that good stuff, and, you, and most uh, uh, newly formed, uh, highly intense star formation regions are embedded in the molecular cloud, and if we just look in there and measure the nitrogen 2, we can count the number of ionizing photons uh, to first order and get uh, how many stars are embedded in there and what type of stars they are by comparing uh, to uh, other fine structural lines. And so we did that, and uh, and we made uh, did, some, did some work on the crater and in that regard. So these are the first detections of this line from the from the ground. And so then we moved at this point to uh, Zeus, and Zeus is the shell graining spectrometer. And uh, here's me in my younger day. There's Zeus on the telescope, and CPA and Dunsey <laughs> did all the work for that guy. And uh, it's at Wooden, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you back up one? Yeah, sorry. Um, the, the uh, resolution you're showing there is, what's the instrumental resolution? Oh, okay, sorry, yeah. interrupt any time, because I know I'm just blabbing. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't to stop you. This um, was uh, 60 kilometers per second. So that's real line broadening? There. Yeah, there is some line broadening. It's about 30 kilometers per second wide, if I remember correctly. Yeah, because it's Carina, and it's an H2 region, remember? So you automatically got something like 10. Yeah, I don't know if you know, yeah, I won't go back. There's more astrophysics on that slide that we can talk later about. Um, okay, so, uh, so Zeus uh, was made specifically to detect these fine, because I've done fine structure lines my whole life. I wanted to do them at high redshift, otherwise I was becoming extinct. And so, uh, so Zeus was uh, specifically to de designed to detect fine structure lines at high redshift. So we matched, uh, we took a diffraction limited beam and we took a, uh, which minimized our photon background, so it minimized our noise. And uh, then we also uh, did a grading spectrometer so that we don't have to spectrally scan, so you get, you get the continuum pixels at the same time you get the line pixels, and made sure we were background limited. And so it turned out at the time that this thing was running, it was about a factor of three more sensitive than any other receiver anywhere uh, in those windows for this type of work, which is broad spectral lines. 
So, oh, I forgot to mention, we match the resolving part of the line width, too. So it's a detected, it was a detection experiment. And so that uh, lived on a CSO for about five years or so. And uh, it's a, a shell grading spectrometer, for those that are into uh, gradings. And uh, it's fifth order at uh, 350 micron, fourth order at 450. And uh, here are some of the fun things from the lab. There's Steve doing all the work, as always. Um, and then he's a grad student. And here's the grading for you optical people. The, the, the groove spacing is a millimeter between the lines. And so you, know, you, can, you might be able to see them from the back of the room. And you can certainly see them from a meter or two away when you're standing in the lab. Uh, you can tell if the grade is installed correctly that way. There's a Leo stop. We need Leo stops in, uh, when we do work in the thermal infrared to cut down on the background. Squeeze the A omega down to its minimum. Oh, and down here are some of the, uh, the refrigerators. That's a helium 3 uh, refrigerator head. And so we specialize in my lab in putting the read into research, which means you do everything 100 times before it works. <laughs> I'm sure some of you are familiar with that phenomenon. <clears throat> And this is the result of our first CSO run on Mauna Kea. <laughs> we actually got about 3% transmission one night. It was just awful. Um, um, but if I had been doing this stuff with heterodyne receivers, so I knew about W49, which had an incredibly bright line. So we proved the thing worked in like 3% transmission by detecting, wow, um, W49. It, 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 didn't, it didn't clear out after. Sometimes when it snows, it gets really nice. Yeah, it, it, for us it did not at uh, that time. Other times it has. Yeah, we, you know, we, were, we were much worse luck when we were on uh, JCMT. JCMT, we had one good run. We went there six times, the rest of the weather was crap. At CSO, we probably went there eight or ten times, and I think that was the only run that we basically got white. But we didn't get totally white because it was the first run, so we proved it worked, right? And so that wasn't so bad. Life could have been worse. This was the first run. And so... Uh, this is just details. And so we detected about, by the time it was retired, about 30 high redshift galaxies in various fine structural lines, all, most of which were the ionized carbon line. And so uh, this is the Bragg sheet. Um, so, so we had the first detection of a mid-J 13 CL rotational line from an external gas thing. Well, what does that mean? That means see, the 12 CL lines are optically thick, so they're just looking at the surface of the cloud. The 13 CL tells you the real column density in the cloud, or at least a better handle. And it also constrains what they call the microturbulent models of the cloud. And so we could get the physical conditions out much better. And we uh, did the first detections and surveys of C plus, the ionized carbon line, which shift one to two. And at the time we did, did this, there were, we had 13 galaxies when our first paper came out and the, everybody else had four, so we, that was a pretty fun time. And then uh, we had, did the first detections of the 88 micron line from galaxies bigger than redshift to 5%, and the same thing with nitrogen to 122 micron lines. And the primary science, I would say, is this. Um, in the local universe, uh, most uh, ultra-luminous galaxies, galaxies with luminosities bigger than 10 to the 12 or so, um, are, uh, are formed by major mergers, things like uh, uh, the antenna galaxy. There's two galaxies. They slam into each other. The molecular clouds, stars don't see each other, like billiard balls. They're very far apart. But the molecular clouds sure as hell see each other. And they slam into each other, and they get very dense. And they form stars because of the high density at a prodigious rate. And you get these super starbursts. But the super starbursts are confined. They're only about 300 parsecs in size, you know. So that's 1,000 light years for uh, those that are not parsec inclined. A parsec challenge. And, uh, but I think, so that's the local universe. And that was the, and what this does is that when you have a very intense starburst, like in a Euler galaxy, the UV field is very high because there's a lot of stars performing per unit volume. And the astrophysics of the situation, and I won't go through it, depresses the C plus line relative to the far infrared continuum. And so this is already seen in the local universe. So when we were building our instrument, everybody said you're not going to see anything because the line's going to be depressed so far that you're not going to see anything. And so of course that bothers us all that more, more building it, but we said, you know, what can you do? You go, you go for it, it's a reasonable thing to do. And much to our astonishment at some level, we were seeing these things fairly easily. And that was because the star formation was widespread. It wasn't compact. So the old local Euler's, there's the picture, the star formation is, this is also an incredibly good illustration, is a very confined, 
And in the high redshift, very luminous systems, it's very extended. So this unit is about 300 parsecs. This unit is about five kiloparsecs, 10 times, 20 times bigger. So it's like the whole disk of the galaxy is going off. And at the same time, people have, uh, were also measuring the molecular content of galaxies at these redshifts and discovering a lot of galaxies would have 100 times the molecular content of the Milky Way. So that all becomes easy to understand. You have a very big disk of molecular gas, 100 times denser than the molecular gas in the Milky Way, or 300 times. And the star formation rate is a function of the, uh, of the uh, density of the, of the disk, how much gas there is in the disk. And it's a function of maybe 1.5 power or something like that. So if you have something with 300 times more density in the disk, it's going to have uh, 300 to the 1.5 times, or as much as a, a few thousand times uh, more star formation. And that's basically what's going on here. And so what is feeding, the, what is feeding these big disks? Well, we speculated uh, that, oh, we're looking at redshift one to three, so to if those people that aren't familiar with redshift, that means you're looking back in time uh, eight to 12 billion years. So within a, you know, four to one billion years of the Big Bang or something like that. What we think is happening is that uh, uh, material is flowing along what's called the cosmic web uh, onto the galaxy at this time and building the thick disk. And so that's what the stream is supposed to indicate. So what's the cosmic web? So the cosmic web is the, uh, is, is the structure of the universe set up by matter condensations. And the first matter to condense was dark matter. And dark matter condensed first because it didn't interact with photons thereby. That's why it's called dark matter. So the normal matter that you and I are made of was interacting with photons until uh, something like a, a half of 300,000 years or so after the Big Bang. And so it was being prevented from joining because the photons were pushing it out because there was scattering off the matter. The dark matter didn't care about the photons, so it could condense earlier. So it formed a structure early at early times. And so over the intervening epoch between 300,000 years and whatever, billions of years, the, and probably still now, the uh, normal matter is slowly gathering on the cosmic web formed by dark matter. And then it streams along that web and can condense on hot spots in that web. So, um, Zeus 2 is a, is a grown up version of Zeus. Uh, Zeus 1 was, a, for example, a wet uh, cryostat with helium and uh, nitrogen, so it's a pain to run. Uh, Zeus 2 is a pain to run because of all the feedback loops that we have, but it's easy to run as far as cryogenics because now we have uh, pulse tubes. Uh, that a lot of you, I think, are familiar with. And an ADR, they're all closed cycle things and we can remotely control it. So we don't go to the summit anymore. We just leave it at the telescope, which is incredibly nice. Because the summit that this thing is on, it's not on the summit, it's on the plane, which is a mere 5,100 meters. That's a pretty high plane. And so in there we have, is right now, this array, and we're just installing these two arrays. I mentioned them before. So we can do uh, three colors at once. We can do uh, this 350 microns, the 450 microns, the 200 microns and the carbon and the uh, 630 uh, microns, and that gives us a carbon one line, another carbon one line gives us temperature, a CO7 to 6 line, a CO6 to 5 line gives us the optical depth of the CO, the hence count density of the CO, and the nitrogen 2 line, which gives us UV photon counts, um, that's in nearby galaxies. So you can image nearby galaxies and do that astrophysics. We put it on the Apex telescope. Beautiful uh, site. There is Sarah Chapman Tour, which I'll mention later. And there's Sarah Chapman Tour again. And there's one of our graduates, too. No. That's not the hat, I think, is what it is. Or Vacuna? Usually somebody should correct me when I call her out. I think it's Vacuna. And, and this is a, the very last of the 50 uh, 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 alma antennas we got stuck behind as it was going up. So it was kind of a treat in a way. <laughs> So the Apex Telescope, I should mention, is a prototype on the telescope. And uh, there's a very old looking man in, in front of uh, the uh, Alma plane. So this is an Apex site, and there's the Alma antenna, so kind of a crummy. But why did it focus on me that should have focused on that? <laughs> <laughs> and there's the cancel guy again. And I'm kinding up the beast. The beast ends up in there. This is a South Pole man, a very good engineer. And uh, there's the uh, hero shot. And there's Chattanooga in the background. Chattanooga is 5,600 meters. And we have good successes to the grad student on that project, Carl Furkenhoff, 
And here after we get our first spectrum, there's us, uh, Thomas Nicola, who's been working with me for a long time. Fantastic colleague. And uh, here's, uh, so I talked a little bit about a C plus survey, and we also started a survey of oxygen three and nitrogen two with Zeus one and our continuum with Zeus two. And here's some of the spectra we've, we've obtained. So what's uh, good about these things? Oxygen three takes 54 EVs to form. You need a hard UV photon, so it needs a massive star to form that. Uh, nitrogen two uh, takes uh, just 14 EVs to form. So uh, uh, even a B star will form nitrogen two. And so if I measure the ratio of those two lines, I get uh, but one more statement. Uh, so the oxygen three and nitrogen two have the same what we call critical density, which means uh, it takes the same number of collisions per second to excite them to the uh, same population the upper level. So density is not a factor in this model. So if I just take the line ratio, I count the number of uh, photons at 35 EVs relative to the number of photons at 14 EVs. So that tells me that what we call the hardness of the radiation fields, which translates into the stellar spectral type or the mass of the main signal star. Um, so that's a nice probe, and these lines are both bright, and we started a little bit of a survey on that. And we're, this survey, because of the windows where they lie, are at redshift three and four, so we're now looking back to the 12 million years. And we expect that, well, as you start to build up statistics, it's very interesting to measure the stellar populations on these super star bursting galaxies. But it's also uh, interesting to think as you get higher and higher in redshift, at some point you should expect to be seeing a tilt in the main sequence towards higher mass stars as the metallicity goes down. Uh, because it's uh, <coughs> more difficult to form stars when there's no metallicity. Metallicity means things that aren't uh, helium or uh, carbon and nitrogen. <coughs> and for the astronomers in the audience, this is our this is our trophy from last summer. This is uh, uh, 0163 micron right my oh it's not six sorry this looks like a four error it's four point six so don't be as impressed as you were a second ago <laughs> so it's four point six um, and uh, this is uh, something that's been imaged uh, by Alma not by us. Uh, but uh, my alma, uh, immediately after we did this, we, this was published. And it's a fantastic place. This size scale of the C plus emission is five kiloparsecs. So it's one of these things like I described. The whole thing is going off like, like crazy. And uh, what's cool is that this thing um, has no velocity shear. Um, so that basically, uh, what I mean by that is the velocity at the top of the disk and the bottom of the disk are the same. Uh, but the velocity breadth is huge, 500 kilometers per second. So something bizarre is going on here, like a huge outflow or whatever. Uh, San, Deos, the, uh, Deos Santos speculate that it's a um, basically a uh, Eddington a limit argument, that it's blowing out. The, the star formation is so rapid that it's blowing the material out, that the uh, photon pressure is blowing the material out. Uh, we find it incredibly interesting to see such bright 63 micron light. The 63 micron line to the C plus micron line ratio is about 20 in this galaxy. Um, that's uh, almost an unheard of number. The only other place that I knew of with 20 is the Orion Nebula. And the Orion Nebula is, uh, is, uh, is an 03, uh, oh, oh God, 07, 06 star within a parsec of a molecular cloud. So the UV field there is 10 to the five times greater than the local interstellar radiation. This whole galaxy has those radiation fields. So that's kind of a wild thing. It's forming stars at several thousand. Uh, the luminosity, three and a half by 10 to the 13 Milky Way is a, is a, a thousand of that number. And so it's forming stars a thousand times faster than Milky Way. So that's our trophy. So our future um, plans, we have more trophies hopefully coming up with this. Uh, our future plans um, are, are muddled a little bit at this point. So if I gave this talk three weeks ago, I would have said, this is definitely it. So CCAT is a 25 meter telescope. We want to put CCAT on top of the uh, Cerro Chapman Tor, the uh, mountain at 5,600 meters. It turns out that extra 600 meters gives you a factor of 1.6 in transmission at 350 microns. So it's hugely important, especially when you do the argument of going in the air mass, right? Uh, and of course, we want a good surface to be an excellent telescope. It's land over uh, 20 at 350 microns. Big field of view, of course, state of the art instrumentation. Uh, consortium members uh, uh, are uh, uh, ourselves at Cornell, Colorado, Boulder, and uh, a consortium of 10 Canadian universities and the universities of Bonn and Cologne. 
And this is the site right there from somebody standing actually on the summit, which is another 60 meters or so above the site. And down there is Alma Plain. So that's 51, 5,000 meters. This is 56, and that's uh, 56, uh, 50 or something like that. So our primary science um, with CCAT um, is to resolve and identify and trace the star formation history of the universe through detecting uh, 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 far infrared bright galaxies. So this plot, um, so some of you may not have seen this. In, in astronomy, this has become a ubiquitous plot in our field. But this is a plot of the energy density in the cosmic microwave background, you know, peaks at a millimeter wavelength, the cosmic infrared background, which uh, peaks at 100 microns, and the cosmic optical background. And the astonishing thing, this came from the Kobe satellite, the kind of astonishing thing is that the cosmic infrared background has as much power as the cosmic optical background. So half the starlight through cosmic time was absorbed by dust and re-radiated in the uh, far infrared bands. So that means if you want to study star formation in the history of the universe and know all about it, you better study the far infrared some of the bands. And that's just the place where we hope, plan to work. So this is uh, a fantastic work by the um, Herschel uh, teams. <laughs> An image of blank sky at uh, 250, 350, and uh, 500 microns. And all these dots are high redshift galaxies. Galaxies, you know, redshift one to three or four. And uh, they're star forming galaxies that the 60 to 100 micron dust peak has been redshifted to 250, 350, and 500 microns. And the various colors are the various, uh, whether they're more dominated by 500 microns or, or 250 microns. And so this image has so many galaxies in it, it's confused. You can't tell if there's galaxies on top of each other. And that's because the beam size of Herschel is something like uh, 20 arc seconds or so. So what CCAT could do, it was 25 arc seconds, maybe, what CCAT can do is zoom in on that because it's not a three and a half meter telescope, it's not in space, it's a 25 meter telescope, so it's eight times uh, better spatial resolution. So you zoom in on that thing, that's what it looks like. Now you can see the waffle in the if you didn't look. Zoom in again, and the sources are overlapping. Zoom in again, they're always off. So basically resolve the cosmic infrared background. And when you do that, you can trace the star formation history of the universe because you can look at individual galaxies, get their redshift, count how many formed at different times, and what types, and how, what the velocity is. So the goal is to see how galaxies assemble and grow, what are the feedback mechanisms, these star, star formation and AGN activity. So AGNs are the black holes in the center of galaxies. They often drive high velocity outflows, which smack into the microclouds. And they can stimulate, or most people think they actually a star formation, or they can break the clouds up and end star formation. Most people are on the, on the latter camp on that. And we want to trace the large scale structure growth in the epoch of peak star formation. So I'll get back to that in a minute because I think we're going to do that with a small precursor telescope. We want to find the very first galaxies, um, and we want to find the beast because we'll get millions of galaxies. We'll find the one in a million galaxies. So the camera that we are, have been envisioning for CCAT is a short wavelength camera. It's got four sub-cameras, each of which is seven arc minutes at 350 microns, one at 450 microns, one at 850 microns, one at 200 microns. You trace out the dust spectral energy distribution of every source, because you have one this on the sky. And uh, you reach the confusion limit at the same time at every wavelength. That's how we pick the number of cameras. And we'll use either transition edge sense photometers, which I described already, or kinetic uh, uh, inductive, inductive uh, detectors, which I didn't describe, but if people want to talk about it. Um, so our current status, as I said, is a little bit muddled. We had some disappointments uh, that led to a hiatus, basically, right now. But what we're looking into, because Cornell, we have money, and we would like to spend it, and uh, start doing some science, and so do the people at Cologne and, and Bonn. And uh, so we're driving in a, uh, towards a six meter pathfinder telescope at the same site. <clears throat> we'll have a, a relatively spectacular surface, nine microns, so it works very well, 200 microns. And uh, this will give us, and it'll be off axis, so that it minimizes the thermal emission of the telescope itself. This will give us unsurpassed surface brightness uh, uh, sensitivity. 
So if something is extended, we, you can't beat it unless you go to space. And so that's basically the direction we're looking at. Uh, and so I think the primary science we're going to get out of that is mapping this large scale structure of the universe in the C plus line, which is a very bright line. And uh, that will give the cosmic structure at, at high redshift. So we're going to look at redshift seven to, seven to 10. Looks back in time before the epoch of dark energy. So now we're in the epoch of dark energy, right? The, the universe is accelerating expansion. And the turnover time, the time when the dark energy apparently started becoming important was at redshift one to two or so. Um, that's what a uh, fundamental question, when did it start becoming important? And then that boils down to fundamental physics, what is uh, dark energy? How is it unfolding over cosmic time? So when we look back at redshift seven to 10, Dark energy is not important. We trace out the structure. Other people, in particular the optical people, are looking at the, the nearby universe, redshift one and two. We look at their structure, look at our structure, statistically and analyze, analyze it and get information about the, the growth of, uh, of structures in the universe, which tells us about the relationship between dark energy and uh, gravity. And so, uh, we're doing a, uh, this I put in there because of the technology I see here. Uh, this is re really low level technology compared to your silicon stuff, but it's my first foray into, in, into actually making uh, silicon based stuff in, in, at Cornell for us. And what we're doing is we're, um, we're trying to perfect Fabry Perot's. So some of the problems that we have with the free metal, uh, freestanding metal mesh Fabry Perot's, one of the problems is that there's drum head frequencies they're stretched. They're very delicate. We, uh, the mesh that we get is commercially available only in certain geometries. And the geometry, only a geometry you ever get is the screen geometry, of course. And it turns out if you do a geometry that's a mix of screens, or actually the best geometry you want to do for mirrors is crosses. Because it gives you both uh, inductive response and uh, conductive response. Which uh, for the, uh, the electric field coming in. So it flattens the reflectivity as a function of wavelength is basically what you're driving at. So you get a uniform finesse as a function of wavelength. Put it on silicon, I can make any funny structure I want to make for the reflector. The problem with the silicon, of course, it has an index of like three and a half or something. So it's a bad uh, material with reflection at the boundary you don't want the reflection to occur at. The other one, you want to be just a mirror and nothing else. With silicon, we have a mirror and we have a semi-mirror. So you get rid of the uh, reflections. And so we investigated that for CCAT and it's found if we put two of uh, these metal layers, right? You basically cut pillars and then cut a second pillar around it. Um, you have a two layer uh, 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 interference film constructed out of uh, material, not uh, layers, right? What was the word I'm trying to say? It's really kind of artificial dielectric metal material. So we put that on uh, one side and gold on the other side. We should get uh, 35 dB uh, 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 suppression of uh, reflection, which is important. You need very high uh, suppression. And then you get it up with nice uh, finesses with good transmission in a very stable substrate. And so we're just starting that project. And so if we envision the one degree field of view fabric Perot, which will have a 20 centimeter etalon made of these silicon uh, disks, and that will be able to map the cosmic weather to C plus line emission. And so here's just a zoom in on what that physically would look like. There's the one degree field of view Fabry Pro. Here's the cosmic web. These are models, of course, right? And uh, here's a, a beastie forming, something that's going to be a, a CD galaxy, a massive uh, galaxy in today's universe. There's the 45 degree, uh, arc second Fabry Pro beam. And you can see the beam is well matched because I'm talking, I, I want something that the beam size is matched to the scale of the luminosity because we are very good at uh, surface brightness. And so you can see that that beam size is just about perfect for detecting these things. And so uh, I think this has a good chance of uh, some success. And uh, of course, we're also using these uh, analogs for other things. And one of the projects I'm involved with is uh, Harvey Mosley's uh, group we're building Fabry Pros that for a uh, thing that's in a uh, competitive stage for uh, Sophia. Uh, to do three kilometer per second resolution of protostars and protostar protoplanetary disks. And here's uh, the famous protoplanetary disk, uh, I think it's HL Tau, um, imaged by uh, AMA, and at uh, three millimeters or something like that, two millimeters. 
and it's just a spectacular image. It looks like it's not real, right? And so uh, what we gonna, are going to be doing is looking at water lines and oxygen lines and other shock tracers like silicon plus and iron lines um, to watch the material raining and forming uh, the, the protoplanetary disk. And so that requires uh, a ridiculous resolving power in the fabric proton, so we need good elements for that. And then also you can do, of course, nearby galaxies in one fell swoop. This is M51, so I think this is maybe eight arc minutes across, and with a one field of view, you get the whole galaxy and then find structure lines. So uh, that's it. Thanks. Any questions? What drives the size of the Zeus twofold? Um, we have maximized the, it's the optics inside the door. Uh, we, we started because, uh, to save money, we, we started with uh, Terry Herter's old doer from his spectrometer kegs that used to fly in the KAL. So Zeus 1 is kegs with its innards ripped out and, uh, and uh, replaced with a submillimeter grating instead of a, uh, a metaphoric grating. And so we have an optics, our, our collimator mirror is really good. Yep. If we had made it this much bigger, we would have got bigger. Okay. Off -ass, uh, aberrations. Off -ass. And, and in the spatial, um, remember your figure in the spatial direction, you have to scan over a source to get the lines, or is it simultaneous? It's simultaneous. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, for your initial operating base spectrometer, um, what's the spectral weight? So which which spectrometer? The uh, initial operating. Yeah. What's the what? Spectral weight. Like the the bandwidth? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, there's the new one, Zeus 2, is um, it could be as many as 40 pixels. Um, and so I'll translate in a minute. But we split the array into two because we do all bands at once. We figure we only need 20. So there's 20 spectral pixels. Each one is about one part in a thousand. So if I'm working in, in there, our primary band is 850 gigahertz. So each one is 850 megahertz wide. So the total bandwidth is 20 times 850, 16 gigahertz or something like that. So if I translate into wavelength space, um, it's uh, 20, two, uh, 20 divided by 1,000, 2% of, uh, of uh, 350 microns. And so that's 7 microns. And yeah, total is 7, is 7 microns. So it's a boatload of kilometers per second. But it's it's difficult. Uh, we when we first were making it, we're thinking that we're going to use it as a redshift machine. I don't think it's a good redshift machine. You have to do too many tunings. People have better ways to do that. But it is forgiving. Uh, yeah, people, you can get redshifts from the pop features. You know the you know, you know what the pop features are. The uh, the, the uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are doing something else that occur at uh, seven and eleven microns and things like that. Those were very well uh, detected by the Spitzer IRS uh, instrument. And so we can look, we can use those redshifts, which are only good to 1% or so, and our line, the line will be there because we have enough bandwidth for that. So, And there's a lot of galaxies we can in principle do uh, with those redshifts. <coughs> Spitzer did a lot. Yeah, I, I might have missed this, but when you're looking at the high redshift, uh, were you looking at carbon? We looked at ionized carbon? Yeah, the, the, the very last stuff? Yeah, yeah so that was ionized that, carbon. So at what point is, is there no carbon in the universe? You're a great question. I knew you were going to say it when you started that way. <laughs> great question. That's what we, uh, I, uh, people see, um, what is the highest uh, secure redshift of quasars? But they see uh, metals in, in absorption. I think it's six or seven. Yeah. There's some talk of some bigger number, but I'm not sure that one's been confirmed. Right? Ten. Ten? Is that one been confirmed? Is it real? Eleven. Yeah, that, this is the highest redshift, but is yeah. it the metals in it that they see? Oh, I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 was, so it was star formation, it was all nuclear synthesis, or it was just some other Yeah, yeah I mean, what happened, what people th think is that the first generations of stars, are, they were these massive things. They spewed crap all over the place, and it's uh, polluted the, IS the oh. intergalactic meeting much faster than any of us expected. I think that's a true statement, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the models say that the metals get in place very quickly once you have stars. Yeah, I mean, like 20 years, you know, 20 years ago, this is incredible that we're so lucky that all this cool stuff is accessible to us, right? <coughs> 
Can I ask, did you say mini CCAT was going to be an offex? Yeah. Is that going to be the biggest offex? No. Um, um, no. No, the SPT, no, SPT is bigger. Yeah. It's, it's uh, 10 meters. Okay. Yeah. 8 meters is really That's right. big. But the rest is more or less a shield. Right? Yes. Because they're, they're, they're really trying very, 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 very hard not to have systematics. So they even use part of their telescope as a shield. That's right. Yeah. But the, and, and the the huge advance here is the surface is is what you say not nine. Yeah, well, the surface wins you something. Uh, the site wins you a lot. So the surface wins 10, 20 percent. The site wins 1.6. Because I was wondering why you weren't just using apex again, but that's because it's um, it's it can't you, get there surface. -wise. So yeah. Um, <laughs> I usually have some middle lecture. <laughs> then I throw it at a student. <laughs> but um, yeah, Apex, we're also um, some of this micro science, you know, a micro version of that huge thing. We're also planning to try with Apex with Zeus because it is a long slit. And we're also, uh, we put in a proposal to modify Zeus to be an image slicer. So you can do it with Apex. Apex is the worst site, factor 1.6, and it's the worst surface. It's a 17 micron surface instead of a, a, a nine. So there, there's some factors of two good stuff. And the fact that uh, we will be building a dedicated uh, instrument to do this will win you other factors that are more difficult. Okay, well thank you very much.